time I do this, I end up revamping it, meaning like I, I get into it and I just, I hear the upgrades, you know, I hear the thing that's like, oh yeah, this, this is, uh, this is needing some upgrading. And so here's, I'll start, I'm going to start with this guys. I'm building up my Instagram and LinkedIn profile. If you're not following me on there currently, just as a favor to me, I'd ask you to do that. I'm trying to get over a thousand uh, specific followers on these accounts so I can start live streaming uh, some of the stuff that I'm doing. But um, I'm gonna skip right to where we were last week. So we went through a handful of these and then we stopped right here. So as I go through this, I just, I, I wanna emphasize the, the reason that we do this, the reason that we uh, are so attracted maybe to this, this type of training is there's something about it that's like, hey, this is what I want. And there's something from maybe a frequency or a vibrational standpoint that we hear it and we go, oh my gosh, that's for me. Like, this is the thinking, this is the logic, this is the undertone, the foundation that's missing to be supporting me and me uh, getting rich or to me obtaining my financial goals or me uh, having financial success. And so really the, the, all that's wanted is for you to be a sponge. All that's wanted right now is for you to allow your brain to reprogram and reconnect new synapse so that you'll start reacting differently to the world around you when it comes to dealing with money. And so having said that, I'm going to just pick up right where we left off and see how far we can get through this uh, while I've got my time with you guys. Uh, Jared will be up. So we'll, we're just going to go right to about 10 o'clock. I usually go about five minutes after and then I'll turn the time over to Jared. Uh, something that I saw this week around goal setting. So I've added some, some new bullets to this. But one of the things I saw around the rich is this thing around goal setting. And average people only set their goals, like they set their goals really high. Like average people set their goals, like what they want, like way, way out, or they don't have goals at all. Like they're just, they're clueless to what they want because their pattern or behavior is around setting their goals completely out of reach. And the rich set their goals high also. So don't think that like, uh, I, you, you just got to get the, this distinction. I think getting this distinction really is going to make a difference. The rich also set their, their dreams, their goals in the clouds, but then they create benchmarks. And let me help you see the logic behind this. So like a child, we're going to use a child as an example. If you were to help a child grow, you're not going to set up challenges that would have you like have the child's goal be completely out of reach. You know, like I, I've got two younger boys uh, that aren't even teenagers yet. And it's like, I'm not going to give them a goal that like is completely impossible for them to achieve. Like it would just demotivate them. You know, it would demotivate them, disenfranchise them. And it, it's going to have, if I keep doing that, it's going to have the, their attitude towards setting goals or it's gonna change their attitude towards like even wanting to work towards goals, uh, like out of the picture, like they're just not gonna to wanna to do it anymore. So instead what we do with kids is we set up challenges where they could fail, but there's actually a high probability of success. There's actually a high likelihood of them getting what they want, but it's a challenge, it's a stretch. And you hear that in a lot of uh, types of trainings that do this experiential type work is we do what's called stretches or we do what's called challenges where it puts us right at our line and then asks us to go a little bit further. And so this is actually the process of creating lasting growth and change, like actually having progress towards the end goal where average people or the poor, they don't do this. They just, they, they like to cheat. They like the sh to find shortcuts and in, when it comes to wealth, there just aren't any. It just, the likelihood of getting a shortcut that will work and will last, it just doesn't exist, guys. The probability is insane. 
And, but they, they put these goals way out there in hopes that someday someone's going to deliver it to them. And then when it never shows up, they wonder why they've stopped setting goals. They wonder why they don't have dreams anymore. They wonder why they don't like setting goals. Like maybe even in this conversation, as you're listening to this, you're starting to get a sense of like, oh, I don't even like this conversation or, oh, I've heard this before. I don't want to be uh, tuned in here or oh, this, this slide's not for me, right? And you can just know that like that resistance towards this conversation has something to do with your past at some point in your developmental stages and some point in you growing as a human being, you got damned. You, your progress got stopped by a goal that was way too far out of reach that someone put in front of you, maybe a mentor or a leader, or maybe even you did it unconsciously. And you actually thought it was within reach, but the reality was it wasn't. There was something closer. There was a benchmark that you should have been aiming towards first. There's, there was a like a rite of passage, you could even say, that had to be hit first before you jumped, skipped, or cheated your way to this end goal. And so this is the benchmarks are the way to get it. Setting goals that are achievable, that are trackable, but are within reach. You know, they're not like way out there and they're timely. They can be done within a week. They can be done within a day. They can be done within, you know, for some of you, a month might be too long. All right. So average people love to be comfortable and the rich find comfort in uncertainty. And this seems a little backwards, especially if you're associating wealth with certainty. For the most part, it takes guts to take risk necessary to make it as a millionaire. And I would even say millionaire like isn't a thing anymore. Like if you're a millionaire or you have a million dollars or you're worth a million dollars, like that's pretty average now. We've been printing so much money that even being a millionaire isn't rich. And so uh, the challenge of the middle class thinkers aren't comfortable, like they're not comfortable living with average. They're not comfortable uh, with not taking risks. They're not living a comfortable average life. Uh, Physical, psychological, and emotional comfort is the primary goal of the middle class mindset. Like, oh, well, I want to feel good. I want to. I want to be healthy. I want to like have this this uh, lifestyle with lots of friends around me and people that are giving me affirmations and you know pumping up my ego. And the the rich just don't do that. World class thinkers learn early on that becoming a millionaire isn't easy and the need for comfort can be devastating. They learn to be comfortable while operating in a state of ongoing certainty. Like the thing you can get comfortable with is that life is not going to be the same. Like just look guys, look at what's happened in the last two years. Look what's happening with our financial situation. People right now, by the way, people right now are like so ecstatic about like how their stocks are doing or how the market's performing or the return on investments, you know, just throwing it in this lazy fund or whatever. And the truth is, is that's not what is actually happening. The world around money is changing. Inflation is happening. Your dollar has lost significant value over the last two years. Now, a lot of people would argue with me and they'd say, well, Matt, you know, that just doesn't make sense. I've looked at the inflation index and it's just not showing that. It's not showing outrageous inflation. And I'd say, well, how much do you actually know about that index? Like, like the numbers that get put into it. And what you'll find is the things that affect inflation the most aren't included in that index at all. They're just including like price of like little goods and, and services where like uh, average cost of living, you're not gonna see that in there or the average cost of a home, not included in the inflationary index. Yet, look at what has happened to home prices, guys, over the last two years. Like, has a home changed in any way? Like, did it start growing gold in like the, uh, <laughs> in the beans or like in the, in the footings? It's like, no, nothing about homes has changed, yet the price has gone through the roof. And why? Because we're printing money. And so this idea that like you can even get comfortable. It, it just is insane. Life is changing, the world is changing and the rich know that they have to adjust and evolve quickly with change.
Average people see money through the eyes of emotion. Rich people think about money much, much, much more logically. And so an ordinary, smart, well-educated, or otherwise successful person can instantly transform into a fear-based, scarcity-driven thinker whose greatest financial aspiration is to retire comfortably. And that's what you've been groomed, I would say, to think. The education system has done a very, uh, has done a very good job of teaching you how to react to fear levers so that we can keep you just where you are. And when I say we, I'm, I'm saying like, it's not even intentional. It's not like the rich are like intentionally trying to suppress the poor. They're not trying to do that. It's just inherent. It's just, it's natural. And it's like, you know, you can, you can tell someone the well's over here, but generally speaking, most people won't go to it. And so we put, like the world has put processes in place to maintain and assist the average type thinking, the average type uh, uh, mentality, but it's really groomed and raised inside of itself. Like the rich haven't gone in and said, hey, we're going to create the education system uh, this way. No, the average person has done that. The rich haven't gone in and said, hey, we're going to change uh, the type of books and entertainment you read. It's like, no, the average person has done that. They've, they've created their own self-fulfilling nightmare. And it's really about how they're thinking about money. And if you watch the markets, if you watch the stock market, you watch uh, any type of financial market, what you'll actually see is that it's mostly driven by the by and through the eyes of emotion and like what majority of people are influencing that it's the average person and so the rich know that they know emotions driving the market they know fear is driving the market they know greed is driving the market and so they're there just hovering waiting for the sign waiting for the the, the moment to pull the trigger to exponentially grow their wealth while the, everyone else is freaking out while everyone else is letting the the influences of the world drastically impact the decisions that they're making about their life specifically in, around how they spend their money how they invest how they how they uh support others with money maybe how they uh grow businesses or don't but it's really it's really through the eyes of do you see things through the eyes of fear? Do you see that through the eyes of your emotions, how you feel? Or do you see things through the eyes of logic? And I'm not saying, you guys, you got to get, like, I'm not saying the rich don't do this. The rich don't have, they're not like immune to not having fear. They're not like fearless. Like, I, they all have insecurities. They all have uh, things around even money, even wealth that doesn't work for them but they know how to put it in check. They're, they're just more uh, trained around get, putting their emotions and fear into check and having a plan that when things were clear, right? Those things were running that, that they knew what to do and they did it anyways. The world-class sees money for what it is and what it's not through the eyes of logic. The great ones know money is a critical tool that presents options and opportunity. So average people follow their dreams. Now, a lot of you guys aren't gonna like this. And I'm just going to say it the way it is, because there's just there's no there's no way to do this without just saying it just the way it is. And it this contradicts what I'm about to say is going to contradict likely what you've grown up to to hear most of your life. And so here we go. So average people follow their dreams. Rich people focus on being rich so that they can have their dreams. And I'm going to expand on like what this means, what. What have you heard that was a lie? Like what did, what did even the rich tell you that was just a blatant lie? If anyone rich ever tells you to follow your dreams, it's because they have already busted their butts to have what they have and are now living their dreams. That's just the truth. I, I have no friends that are rich that got there by following their dreams. I have no friends that are rich that got there because they had some, some thing that they love doing 
Another word would be their passion. And they followed their passion and somehow that ended up in them becoming rich. It is very, 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 very unlikely. And if you get so lucky, here's, here's the, the bummer around this. Here's, I'm just bringing reality to you. If somehow you're able to turn a passion into a wealth generating machine, maybe you're an athlete, or maybe you're a musician, or maybe uh, you have some skill set that you've refined around some technology or whatever, and you're just, that's your passion. What ends up happening is, is the opposite. Most people don't just have one passion or dream. In fact, many people can't even clearly define what their dreams are. And what's been found is those who make their passion, like their passion, the means to wealth, lose the passion around it. And I, I challenge you to actually go and get real interviews from people who are rich because of what was their passion. Ask, and like people ask them like, well, what is it like now? And over 90% of them will answer like, it's work now. It's not something I love doing. It's work now. So it's like, guys, it's kind of like damned if you do, damned if you don't. I, what I'm saying is that rich people focus on being rich. Like if money is happening over here, if there's just a pile of money over here and there's like a couple dollars over here and your passion is over here. And yes, you could get lucky and get all the money that's over there or that your passion's not over here and there's just stockpiles of cash. Where are you going to go? Because the rich doesn't care like money doesn't care, like in and of itself, a hundred dollar bill sitting on the table, it doesn't care if it has anything to do with your passion. It just doesn't care. It doesn't care if it has to do with your dreams. It just doesn't care. Money in and of itself has no capacity to move itself, to transform itself, to become a use without human beings. And there are certain rules around money and where money is, typically isn't inside of people's passions. It's just not. The, the, those people who get rich, get rich because they're not following passions. They're doing what other people are unwilling to do. They're, they're going after people. They're going after things. They're going after projects that others are just unwilling to do. And maybe it's even in an industry you're already in. And it's like, why are some people rich and some people aren't? It's because people in that industry are willing to do what others aren't. That's why. And so now we're talking about something very different that the rich have access to. Now we're talking about uh, being able to do what others are unwilling to do. And like, how, what's the drive? Like, what's the, the type of person does it take to do those type of things, to step in where other people are unwilling to step? What type of being does it take? Average people set low expectations, so they never are disappointed. Rich people are up for the challenge. So kind of tying into some of the last couple points, psychologists and other mental health experts often advise people to set low expectations for their life to ensure that they are not disappointed. You go to counseling, you know, maybe you're, you got some relationship issues and you, you know you're in therapy or maybe you, there's, you're just you've got anxiety or you, you're, you know you're dealing with some levels of depression or whatever right and you go to these mental health experts and often very often what's recommended the diagnosis is to start setting your expectations lower and they do these through a series of exercises like oh well you shouldn't expect that person that you love to be like that. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have expectations that your life should be different. And, and yes, it works. If you can get someone to lower their expectations, they're obviously gonna be a lot less disappointed around it. But that's not what defines the rich and the poor. Like that's, it has nothing to do with that. There's something wrong with our thinking as average, poor minded individuals. There's something wrong with our thinking that like we can, again, cheat or rob ourselves the actual experience of life. And we do it by 
by lowering our expectations, which you think that's actually going to fix? Like, you think that's actually going to work or do you think that's just a Band-Aid? Like, do you actually believe that lowering your expectation in life is going to actually have you feel more fulfilled? That, like, you, you would end your life, like, and you're, there you are on your deathbed, and you're like, wow, I'm just so grateful for how life went for me. Or would there be regret? And how much does that weigh? No one would ever strike it rich and live their dreams without far-reaching goals. And again, remember the last belief that we went through, right, around goals. It's like, set your goals way out here, but you've got to have benchmarks that can be achievable. You've got to have things that occur like wins. Otherwise, you'll start training the brain that I should never set goals because I never achieve them. I never win. Now, I'm not saying you're not going to fail sometimes. you got to have some resilience, right? But the, the end goal is to have big goals and benchmarks so that you have little successes along the way. Average people believe that you have to do something to be rich. Now, hear this. Average people believe that you have to do something, like the do, the, the, the doing part. Rich people believe you have to be something to be rich. And what I mean is uh, average people like, they like to think it's, it's out there. Like the world of getting rich is out there. Like, oh, if I had money to invest in this, if I had money to buy this thing, if I, if I had more resources to buy leads or whatever, right? How many, how many of us have been uh, or have heard or have even internally said something like this around our own financial situation? Oh, if I just had more money. Well, that's why people like Henry Ford go bankrupt, then rebuild the most popular car company in America. It's not just him. It's thousands of other rich people. Like how many of you guys know someone just right off the top of your head who's rich and has gone bankrupt or has massively failed in a business? I, I can name a handful of my friends who have been through this, my personal friends. And it's like, it doesn't stop them because it's not, they don't invest they're, the main thing they invest in isn't a thing. It's not uh, the next franchise they're buying into. It's not the, the next, uh, you know, stock pick or crypto maybe or whatever. That's not the thing that they're focused on investing on. The main thing they're focused on investing in is themselves. And while the masses are fixed, uh, fixated on doing and the immediate results of their actions, the great ones are learning and growing from every experience, whether it's a success or a failure. Knowing their true reward is becoming a human success machine that eventually produces outstanding results. You, you gotta get, you are the machine. You are. And you are either a money-making, wealthy machine or you're not. Or you're somewhere in between, right? But there's there are, things about you as an individual that wherever you go, you're going to hit on those levels. And maybe as CODs, you guys came here thinking this COD, investing in the COD is going to make me money. And it's just not. I'm gonna buy this other franchise and that's gonna make me money. It's not. I'm gonna go be, do this insurance thing and it's gonna make me money. And I'm gonna buy a bunch of leads. It's not. None of those things are going to make you rich. You are going to make you rich. And if you are a rich making machine, you can put yourself in any of those things I just described and you'll get rich. It's why I have partners and CODs that are making 10 times, 20 times, even in some cases, 50 times what some of our other CODs are making. Why? It's the same, it's the same vessel. It's the same uh, vehicle. But why is someone getting an output that's radically different than the other? And it's because they themselves are a money-making machine. And so it's like, we got we to gotta take more time like this. You got to take more time to be in, in meetings like this. More opportunities to challenge how you think. More opportunities to challenge uh, how you respond and react in real life. We've, we've got to be taking our life on more often rather than just coasting and doing 
the, the paperclip filing, the, the day-to-day, the grind, right? Like really think about it, guys. How many of you guys just go home, you tune out, you go watch your TV shows and you're not taking time to contemplate your life. You're not taking time to be silent. You're just chat, 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 talk, 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 regurgitating. It's really just reacting back and forth. It's, it's really, when you can really see it and step out of it and watch even people doing it, it's just a program running. Really, it's the same conversations. It's the same things that are being said over and over and over. And you're wondering why you're not growing at all. You wonder why you're not getting what you want out of life. It's because you're just doing the same thing in and out every day. So it's like, stop waiting for the world out there to make you rich. You've got to start doing something about the world in here, about the world up here, right? So average people believe you need money to make money. Rich people use other people's money. And this is the idea of of leverage. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. But linear thought might tell people to make money in order to earn more. The rich aren't afraid to fund their futures from other people's pockets. Guys, you will not learn this in school. In fact, there is no class in even college that's going to teach you how to leverage people's money. They're just not. While the rich, that's all they're doing. They're leveraging money. They're leveraging uh, teams. They're leveraging tools to help make them money. They're, they're using them as a lever. You, got, you understand what lever, leverage is, right? It's like by in and of myself, I couldn't pick this rock up. But if I get some leverage with the right amount of it, I can lift the rock. And so like the rich know they're incapable. They're not idiots. They're not idiots enough to say that that they can do it on their own. They're humble. They know their weaknesses. Like I'm a fragile uh, skin-based, just flesh and bones, right? Just a bag of flesh and bones. Like we innately as human beings are weak. Like it's in our, it's just who we are. We're not, we're not built to be emotionless. We know we have weaknesses and the rich know that and they know their weaknesses and they put structures and things in place to deal with them anyways. And so money, not having it is never, it's never a problem. Henry Ford, when he, he went bankrupt, do you think him having not having money even occurred to him as an issue? No, because he knew he could leverage other people's. And a lot of you right now, especially those of you who are in business for yourself, You are scared to death to leverage other people's money. You are scared to death to go get an investor, to go get someone to like radically lift your company, uh, to take it to another place using other people's funds. Why? I don't know. Because maybe at a young age, very young age, you were taught to save. You were taught that you had to earn it. You were taught that you had to go out and make it on your own before you could have it. I don't know. But we're adults now in the world of money, we have way more tools than you did when you were a child. And so it's like, it's time to grow up. It's time to grow up. It's it's time to start dealing with the real world around money and start knowing your options. Rich people know that not being solvent enough to personally afford something is not relevant. It just doesn't matter. It doesn't, guys. Like if you're still fighting this, I'm just gonna keep saying it. It doesn't matter. It does not matter. The real question is, is this worth buying, investing in, or pursuing? If you have something that's valuable, if you have something that will make a return, if you have a great idea, you don't even, none of this, everything has risk, guys. But if you have a great idea, people invest in great ideas. They just do. And then it goes back to, well, okay, in order to have a great idea or be someone that people would invest in, who would I have to be? Because you put me next to someone else and like, I I can just tell you nine times out of 10 in a group of 10 just randomly selected people, I'm gonna give my elevator pitch and people are gonna invest in me. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant, 
I'm saying that because I hold a level of confidence around my ability to go out and make money. And people get that. They get it. And so if I go ask for it, they're going to give it to me because they trust it. And so again, a lot of these go together, right? But who you are being is going to radically improve your ability, like your, your uh, natural pool that you can get money around. Now, banks don't have that bias. They don't know who you are other than what's on paper. And leveraging bank money or leveraging uh, even the like, like, like federal money, there's a lot of federal money out there for new businesses and new startups. And it's like leveraging that also can make a big difference. And how many of you guys have been in your business and you haven't even spent an hour looking that up, but you've spent 12 hours watching that sitcom. You've spent a week binging some show and you've spent zero time investigating where you could even find money, where you could get leverage in your business. So whatever you're hearing right now, like write it out, guys. Commit to something. Create some action that's coming from this training. Average people believe that the markets are driven by logic and strategy. Rich people know they're driven by emotion and greed. We we're kind of going back to that stock market analogy, right? Like literally the lines, the candles that go up and down in the market literally represent the feeling and emotion of the people. Like that, it's like a direct reflection of what's going on. And rich people know that. They're not part of it. They, they know how to separate themselves from it. They know so much how to, to disassociate their feelings to their actions that they, you know, they might get drawn in. There might be something happening, another twin tower attack or an, another COVID virus. And yeah, you know, you're going to have some stuff come up. You might, you're going to feel afraid. We're, I'm just as human as the rest of you. But I know how to separate that and go, okay, I acknowledge I'm afraid. Now let's look at how this is impacting the market. Knowing that I'm afraid, how's the average person taking this? And how's that going to impact the market? And then what's going to happen? What's going to be the, like, the ripple effect? Who's going to come in and save the day? Is the government going to bail this out? So on and so forth. And based on that, you can logically see opportunity. You can logically see things that uh, didn't exist because when you're in a state of emotion, when you're in a state of uh, fear, uh, you're in the fight or flight part of the brain. The reptilian part of the brain is going nuts. And how much, uh, how much power do you think you have to act out of logic? Zero, this much. Because the brain has no, your logic receptors aren't in that part of the, the brain. It's either saying, I'm going to fight, which fighting, you know, for some of you, it, it works, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flee, right? It's fight or flight. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna run. And for some of you that works also, but that's two possibilities out of infinite possibilities. And so fight or flight is really designed to keep you alive. It's not designed to, to help you stay rich. It's not designed to help you uh, get out of being poor or average. You see that? And so we've got to put those things in check. You acknowledge it, acknowledge the thing going on in the back of the brain and move on. So investing successfully in the stock market isn't just about fancy math formulas. It's not just about indicators, guys. It's not just about uh, having a good charting platform or having some unique edge in the market. The rich know that the primary emotions that drive financial markets are fear and greed, period. Just period. If you could operate traders, Knowing just that, how would you trade differently? Having all the tools you have access to, all the knowledge and wealth you already have around the financial markets, if your main objective was to see the market through the eyes of fear and greed, how would you trade different? And they factor into this all trades and trends they observe. This knowledge of human nature and its overlapping impact on trading give them strategic advantage in building greater wealth through leverage. So it's like, you're going to go in knowing the market reacts in response to fear and greed. Knowing that, how are you going to go into trading differently? How are you going to go into investing differently? How are you going to go into growing your wealth differently? Knowing that. And that's where opportunity lies, guys. That's where those big wins exist. Excuse me. 
Average people live beyond their means. Rich people live below theirs. And I can't tell you how many times I see this. I, I, <laughs> both Kevin and I uh, have lived in homes much smaller than people that have worked for us. We have driven cars much less elegant than people who have worked for us. We have uh, had more modest parties and more modest vacations than most people that have even worked for us. And so there's a common misconception that the appearance of wealth is wealth when it's not. That the appearance of having money is uh, makes you rich when it doesn't. I mean, a, a, a great example of this is look at Warren Buffett. Like Warren Buffett, just after this, go look up like Warren Buffett's home, Warren Buffett's lifestyle, Warren Buffett's car. And you'll see that this guy, if you just met him, would not look like he was wealthy. Now, that doesn't mean that the goal, the reason why you're trying to have wealth is to have luxury. That's fine. But you, one has to happen before the other. And here's how, the, here's how to live below your means and tap into the secret wealthy uh, people have used for centuries. So like, if, if you want to get wealthy, you, you've got to get this order right. You have to get rich first so that you can afford to. Because we use the, the language afford, like I can't afford that. And then the moment you can, or the moment you can get leverage on a credit card or something to buy it, you do. And it's like, you got to get rich first so that you can have those things later. The rich live well below their means, not because they're savvy, but because they make so much money that they can afford to live like royalty while still having a king's ransom stocked away for the future. Uh, something I heard, I was actually at a, a dinner a uh, week before last, and one of the richest people in Utah, he's a billionaire in the state of Utah, I was at a table having dinner with him, and we were talking about uh, this money idea, and he shared with me and a friend of mine, John, who was a mentor of his, like, what, what's the, the thing that you remember the most from, you know, this guy who mentored you? And the thing he said is he told me very early on as an entrepreneur that I need to work harder than anyone, like insanely. Like I need to be more disciplined and work harder than anyone I know for 10 years so that I can live the rest of my life unlike anyone else. And it's just the truth. If you think you're going to get rich in a year, it's, it's just like... I, I don't know how you're going to do that. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm not saying that maybe you're already on the precipice and then, you know, it's just a couple things tip you over, but it's like, there's a level of commitment that you have to have around this that is unlike anyone you know. Otherwise, if you're doing what everyone else is doing, how can you have something different than what everyone else has? It's just not possible, guys. It's not logical. But what I will tell you is we all have the same clock. We all have the same numbers. Every clock I've looked at, it ticks the same for me as it does for anyone else. But let me share the payoff versus the cost around busting your A now versus worrying about busting your A later. And it goes something like this. We both have the same time now. I'm going to maybe even have less money in my bank account now, in theory, than, than I will later. However, my investment in time now around commit, my, my commitment towards wealth, my commitment towards growth, in 10 years from now, the time that I now have compared to someone else, like, for example, the amount of time it takes me to make $100 today versus 10 years from now is at least, at least 10 times the average person. So what it's done for me is I'm, the clock still goes around the same way for me today as, as it did 10 years ago. The difference is, is my commitment, my commitment towards what I wanted now has me leverage money in a time sense radically different. 
at least 10 times more, at least. So th this is where, and I'm gonna wrap it up on this. This is where I would look at, like think about how much you make in a month. Like think about how much you make in a week, how much you make in an hour. And I want you to just take the theory, the idea that whatever it is, I want you to take it back a step. So like if you make $100,000 in a year, I want you to consider doing that in a month. If you make, you know, um, if you make $10,000 in a month, you know, I would have you consider doing that in a week. If you make $10,000 in a week, I'd have you consider doing that in a day. And that's the type of growth I'm talking about if you get committed to your wealth. It exponentially compounds over time, not because of the thing out there, but because of the vessel right here. Like you become a vessel around money that knows how to magnify it. You know how to multiply it in ways that just the average person, they, they don't even conceptually, even now to you conceptually, it might seem and occur impossible. I remember guys, I actually remember a time where I was like, to make $100,000 in a month would be insane. In fact, I remember even six, seven years ago, it was like 10, 000, to make $10,000 in a month uh, was like a good, you know, it was like, yes, you know, I, this seems normal. You know, like I'm finally in my curve. Like I'd be really happy doing this, but I just stayed disciplined. I stayed what I was doing, like kept, kept the, uh, the level of vigor and tenacity towards my growth. And the next thing I know, it's like to make $100,000 in a month is not that big a deal anymore. And it's like, again, how do, how do you get to this place? And it's the discipline. It's the discipline of doing what everyone else is unwilling to do for a time period that they are unwilling to do it for. And that payoff will exponentially grow over time. Where just imagine there's two yous out there, guys. There's the you that doesn't take this challenge. There's the you that isn't going to take this serious. And then there's the you that did it. There's the you that got disciplined. There's the you that made uh, extreme, not, I'm not going to say mild, extreme sacrifices, extreme. They, it, it made, it made, uh, it had discipline, unlike anyone that you know today, like unlike anyone. Like you don't even know people that have this level of discipline. Like that's the type of person that you get to be. And just ask yourself, looking at those two futures, you're going to be there anyways, guys, in five to 10 years. You're going to be there. Which one do you want to be? Like which one inspires you? Which one do you think is going to inspire your children? Which one do you think is going to inspire the people around you? Which one do you actually think is going to feel more fulfilling? When you die, which one do you think you would rather have died experiencing? And if you can bring that truth to you right now and you can and like you can remember it every day, that will be the motivation that keeps you going every day, even when it's hard, even when it's difficult, even when it, it seems like it's unreasonable. Well, guess what? It is. It is unreasonable because everyone else isn't doing it. They're just living average lives, subpar standard lives. I'm happy, but I'm not exhilarated. And so this is, this is the future you've got to pull to yourself every day. And you've got to do that a day at a time, then a week at a time, then every month, then every year, and then year after year. And that might occur to you as exhausting, but I can tell you the end result isn't. What's exhausting is wanting something and never getting it. What's exhausting is lowering your expectations, lowering your goals and living a subpar life. What's exhausting is, it's, is like seeing inspiring people, but not being inspiring. All right, guys, thank you so much. This is again, one of my favorite trainings and um, I'm gonna call this complete. There are a couple other slides after this. I'm gonna call this complete so we can move on next week. Thanks so much. And Jared, uh, sorry to go over, but you're up. Well, that's perfect. No, thank you, Matt. That leads in perfectly really what we were going to talk about with coaches anyway. So perfect.